This is Rumpole and the Learned Friends. This is Rumpole uh, defending a, an alleged safe blower who finds himself up against a rather bent uh, police inspector called Dirty Dickinson. And how Rumpole gets across, as he always will get across, Judge Bullingham, who is one of the savagest judges down the Old Bailey and is constantly at war with Rumpole, as Rumpole is with the judge, whom he calls the Mad Bull. In the course of this trial, Rumpole gets in trouble with the authorities about the way he conducted the defence. But uh, in the end, you will discover that uh, the defence he conducted was perhaps totally satisfactory. It also shows the learned friends, the other barristers in chambers, perhaps trying to get rid of Rumpole because they think he's reached the age of retirement and he's being helped by uh, the new young barrister, Philly de Tramp. Rumpole doesn't, of course, reach the age of retirement and will never reach the age of retirement. So there he is, I hope, to entertain you again. Rumpo, you're not normal. I'm dying. Nonsense. What did Dr. Hansen say it was? Death. He says there's a lot of it about. Uh, look, we know you down the post office. You got nothing to say to me, Charlie? Bail. He had the gun. Is that what you want to tell me? You were only along to do the safe. My missus is queer. You're opposing bail. You talk about the safe, and I'll talk about bail. Is that a promise? Of course it's a promise. Shake hands on me. You afraid to shake hands with a copper? Right, Charlie. That didn't hurt now, did it? Now more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret. Dr. Hansen says you're not dying, uh, you've just got flu. Open. Uh, hell. Oh. Uh, oh, imagine. Death, no more judges. <laughs> No more bowing and scraping, if your lordship pleases. No more listening to interminable, turgid speeches from my learned friends, the prosecution. <sighs> to cease yes. upon the midnight with no pain. Oh, no, I'm afraid you can't speak to Mr. Rumpel at the moment. Who can't speak? No, I'm afraid he's busy at the present. I'm busy, I'm not busy. Is he dying? Well, that's what he says he's doing anyway. So he's not available. No, Henry, not this week, certainly. It's my clerk, Henry. Give me the phone, give me the phone. Henry! Hello, sir, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm not too bad, Henry. Uh, not dying, then, sir? D no, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> no touch of flu, that's all. Could you handle a touch of safe blowing, sir? Safe blowing? Gone Brixton 2.30. Brixton 2.30. I shall be there, Henry. Are you sure, sir? Quite sure. I'll fling on a few togs. Oh, champion, Mr. Yes, yeah, bye. Dying, Rumpel. Dying, no. Die!
will have to be postponed. Safe blowing comes first. What is it, Esmond Brown? Yeah, I've got bits of your particulars of nuisance in here all over my defence and counterclaim. Oh, yes, I'm sorry about that. Henry put me in here last night. Good morning, Miss Brown. Oh, morning. Excuse me. Hoskins had a conference up in our room. Oh, really, the accommodation problems in these chambers are becoming ridiculous. My new pupil has to share a desk with Fiddy here. Well, I'm also sorry. I'm afraid I can't help you. The room's put a cup of tea down upstairs. Oh, really? Oh, really? Well, I suppose we'll just have to hang on in this black hole of Calcutta a little while longer. He can't be with us forever. What? Who can't be with us forever? Rumpole. He's bound to retire sometime. He's a good age, and Henry was telling me he's not been at all well. Morning, Rumpole. Oh, good morning. I thought you were off sick. No, no, completely recovered now. Ah. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Nasty Cody, boy. Oughtn't you to be in bed? Nose to the grindstone, Miss Grant. Women are such industrious creatures. What's your brief? Oh, just a thief. Uh, he has to plead guilty. He doesn't want to, of course. Of course. Will you twist his arm, Philly? Yes, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Sophia's don't like wasting the court's time with hopeless cases. Yes, I suppose it's hopeless. He's said such ridiculous things to the police. Never plead guilty. That should be written up in letters a foot high on every room in Chambers. Foot high? Yeah, we've got room for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Haven't you know about Edgar? No, I've been dying. Oh, no, don't do that. I could miss your help with the crossword. Oh, the justification for my existence, helping George Frobisher with his crossword. <laughs> I don't know, Henry, I'm going to have to take Well, I'm glad you've arrived, sir, because they want the two of you down there at 12 o'clock now. Oh, oh, bless you, The two of us? Yeah, the defendant Wheeler's got a certificate for two counsel. Has he? Give it to your junior, are they? Someone to take notes? Well, not exactly, Mr. Rumpole. You're being led. They're uh, brief and a silk. You can take it easy to one, sir. I don't want to take it easy. Haven't they got the message yet? I'm off the leading rein. I'm out of rumpers. I need the pen bungalow murders without a leader. Yeah, I'm sure they appreciate that, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, hello, Rumpel. Oh, hello, Captain. Well, you're going to be seeing a lot of my back this week. Uh, what do you mean, a lot of your back? I'm leading you in the Dartford Post Office robbery. You're leading me? Morning, Mr. Featherston. You were quite right, Miss Tran. I should have said that I wouldn't bet. Died. You ask me, this case is as dead as a doornail. So are we all, eventually. Wheeler's fingerprints on a lump of jelly knife. I know. Found by the safe. I know, I know. <coughs> I wonder why I didn't leave his visiting card. Well, I'll tell you, old darling. Old guns like Charlie Wheeler don't have visiting cards. After you, my learned leader. Leaders always go to Brixton first. Oh, I'm that glad to see you, Mr. Rumble. Hello, Charlie. It's amazing the reputation you've got round D-Wing. <laughs> oh, well, they can write that on my tombstone. He had a great reputation round D-Wing. Hey, you're not going to die, are you, Mr. Rumble? I have been considering it. Because I'm that glad you're doing my case. Oh, well, I, uh, I'm not exactly doing your case, Charlie. Oh, you're not? No, your case is being handled by Mr. Guthrie Featherstone, QCMP. His name is constantly mentioned in the corridors of power. Oh, well, I haven't heard much about him in the corridors of D-Wing. Uh, Rumpo, if I... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Guthrie Featherston, QCMP, Charlie, how you doing? 
All right, now then, Wheeler. It means you, Charlie. Rumpole, please. Yeah, I shall make a note of your words and wisdom from now on. What I wanted to say, Wheeler, was... Oh, no, no, no. We're here yes. to fight this case, and we're not going to leave not stone too fast to turn to fight it. <laughs> to the best of my poor ability. <laughs> my poor ability. Mr. Bernard has no doubt told you who our judge is to be. Oh, yeah, I know, Judge Bullingham. So... Any sort of attack on the honesty of the police, I told you, Charlie. Would act like a red rag to a Bullingham. <laughs> as you told him that. Yeah, but Mr. Bernard explained it all to me. I mean, I don't want to lay into Dirty Dickerson. No. Who's that? Oh, Detective Inspector Dickerson. He's the officer in charge of the case. No, I mean, there's not a whole lot of point. Well, exactly. You see, we, uh, the case against you is indisputable. So what is the point of annoying the judge with a whole lot of questions? You want to... If I was to say nothing against it, gentlemen, if I was to keep quiet, like, uh, how much, Mr. Rampo? Eh? I was open for an eight. Eight? Oh, oh, hope springs eternal in the human breast. In my experience... Now, listen any, to the wise words of the learned leader. Any sort of attack on the police in a case like this will add considerably to your sentence. So, let's be sensible. And uh, I must warn you, Wheeler, the time may very well come when I have to throw in my hand. You mean that Charlie's hand, don't you? Does he? You can't make bricks without straw. Down the belly, old darling. You've got to make bricks without bricks. You don't get the luxury of straw. Of course, I'll mitigate. Mitigate? My lord, my client only went in to buy a sevenpenny stamp. But as he was kept waiting by ten old ladies with pension books, he lost his patience and blew the safe. Very good mitigation. Forget mitigation for a minute. What's the use of spending the whole of your life in an attitude of perpetual apology? Do you think that an old con like Charlie Wheeler would blow a safe without wearing gloves, even at a sub post office in Dartford? Right. Do you think he would have left a bit of spare jelly tied around with his dabs on it? Is that the mark of a professional? I ask you. Well, think about it, Fergus Lemke. It's about as likely as you standing up in court and mitigating in your pyjamas. Oh, dear. Is that yours? T.C. Rowley in the hospital. Uh, so I hear he's not too well. Well, who is nowadays? Well, no, no, but I understand Uncle Tom is distinctly seedy. Are you? Over 80? A good age? What's good about being over 80? Mr. Rumpel. Yeah. Excuse me, Philby. Well, I'll be off. My name's yes, Philby. Yeah. Any messages for Uncle Tom? I write the oh. in-depth column in the Sunday. Give him my love. Oh, uh, tell him we'll all be joining him eventually. Oh, really, <laughs> Rumpel. <laughs> Mr. Philby, I'm sorry. Sit down, sit down. I think I've seen you on the press bench, haven't I? I'll always be grateful to you fellas for the space you gave me. The Penge Bungalow murders, no doubt you recall. I think that was before my time. Oh, yes, probably reported by your grandfather. I was in court when you defended Ken Aspen, the rape case with the Member of Parliament. Not one of my major triumphs. It's very impressed indeed with the way you cross the town of the guy. Good uh, morning, Robert. Yes, all right, George. Aren't they? Well, I'll just talk to Uncle Tom. Yeah. Oh, uh, do give him all our best. Thank you, Paul. Right. See you tomorrow. Yes. Oh, by the way, asking about Henry was telling me that you're prosecuting in the Dartford Post Office case. Yes, that's right. Well, that's very civilised. Well, I hope so. I don't mind an occasional crime, provided one's on the right side. The right side being the prosecution? <laughs> yeah, well, of course, yes. <laughs> Bless you. Oh, I gather you're leading rumpole in this. <laughs> well, I hope to be able to make that clear eventually. I'm sorry, um, make what clear? Who exactly is leading who? <laughs> <laughs> Well, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. What I really wanted to ask you, Mr. Rumpel, uh, was... Yeah? You're defending Charlie Wheeler. Oh, yes, an old acquaintance. The police officer on that case is Detective Inspector Dickerson. That's right, Dirty Dickerson. Dirty Dickerson. You know how he got that name. No, I don't, as I should, but I don't. Tell me all, Mr. Philbin. 
But you might be interested. You see, I, I once did an interview with a man called Harris. Mm. Harry Harris. Uh, sort of minor South London villain. Loads of conviction. Oh, sounds like my sort of criminal. I'm surprised I don't know him. I never printed it, of course. But uh, Harris told me that Dickerson once handed him a stolen cigarette case. Then, when Harris had his fingerprints all over it, Dixon asked him for 300 quid not to prosecute him. Glory, hallelujah. You're a blessing in an excellent disguise, Mr. Philby. I trust this was not an isolated incident. Oh, I have a whole file on uh, Dickerson. I should very much like to use it, but I can't here. Yeah. You see, the editor does like to win his libel action. Oh, there we are. You know, quite a lot of villains have Dixon on a regular retainer. Really? I thought you might be interested. Indeed I am. Look, do you think you can lay hands on this Harry Harris for us? Well, I know the pubs he goes to. It shouldn't be too difficult. Well, do try, Mr. Philbin. Leave no pub unturned. Harry Harris could be the straw we might make a couple of bricks with. Here, drink up. Have another. Yes. Oh. Mr. Fingleton, are you an expert in the matter of fingerprints? Yes. <laughs> and do you produce enlarged photographs of the first, second and third fingers of the defendant, Wheeler? Uh, yes. Are those his admitted fingerprints, Mr. Featherstone? Yes, are admitted, my lord. I'm very much obliged to you, Mr. Featherstone. Yes, I'll bet you are, old darling. And do you also produce in large photographs of the fingerprints on the small piece of gelignite, Exhibit 12? Yes. Now, what do you say about those two sets of fingerprints? Well, I found 32 uh, distinct uh, points of the... Uh, points of... Similarity. Yes. And by points of similarity, you mean... Well, the break in the first whirl on the index finger, uh, for instance, my lord, it's the same in both cases. Yes, yes, yes. I think the jury can see that quite clearly. And so, Mr. Fingleton, what is your conclusion? Just tell the jury. Well, my conclusion is that the fingerprints are identical. <laughs> identical. Thank you, Mr. Fingleton. Mr. Featherstone. Oh, no questions, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Merton. What? Well, I can't do anything with this evidence. No, you can't. I call Peace Constable Hoddle, my lord. No bloody questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're not normal, Guthrie. In fact, you're 102. Oh. You can't go to court tomorrow. Oh, I didn't realize it was so serious. Yes, well, it is. Yeah. I'm not having you get pneumonia for the sake of some petty thief. You've got the Foreign Office dinner next week, and your speech on devolution. Oh, yes, that's true. Oh, dear. It couldn't have come at a worse time. Surely your junior can carry on. Well, there's really not much to do. In fact, after the way the case went today, the sooner we plead guilty, the better. Who is your junior? Horace Rumpole. Oh, well, he can do the mitigation. Yes, he can cope, I suppose, with the mitigation. I'll get the number for you. Now, just drink this up. Come oh, along. Oh, no. Yes. Oh. There we go. I'm sorry, dear. You're not well, old dear. Yes, yes, sir. Listen. Yeah. Do you realise, of course, what you've got to plead? Oh, yes, of course. So it's vital that we don't attack the police evidence. Absolutely. <laughs> No, it's all right. I'll adopt your technique. Oh, I did admire that so much. No questions, my lord. I'll be back as soon as I can. Now, you stay in bed, Guthrie. 24 hours at least. You don't want to relapse. No, leave everything to me. Rely on Rumpel. Bye. Oh, frabjous day. Caroo, carry. He chortled in his joy. Oh, what's the matter with you, Rumpel? Matter, nothing is the matter. It is an occasion for rejoicing. I have given my learned leader the flu. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Rumpel, Tim. That's correct. I wonder if he's in yet. Bill Beam, hold on it. There you are. 
Have you found Harry Harris for me yet? No, I came to tell you. I, I must have been on 20 past last night. Morning, Rob. Uh, I have a number to phone. It's a place where his sister works, but there won't be anyone there until 9.30. Oh, do keep trying, old darling. We may be all set for the unmasking of Dirty Dickerson. Inland Revenue. Oh, thank you very much. We've had one extraordinary piece of luck on this case. Oh, really? What's that? Mr. Guthrie Featherston, QCMP, the world's greatest mitigator, is docked in bed for the remainder of the trial. Uh, wretched luck about Featherston, Horace. Oh, wretched. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. You've got Wheeler, have you? Charlie Wheeler. Well, I don't think he's gone out anyway. Uh -huh. He don't get many invitations. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joyce. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm afraid the conference is off. Oh? Uh -huh. Mr. Bernard's gone to a funeral. Oh, not here. He's very much tired. Oh, that's all right, then. I'll, uh, I'll just pop down and see Charlie. I think I have a fraud in the West Court. Well, that's all right. You run along, my dear. I believe I can cope with the conference alone without help. Mr. Rumpole, you... It's all right, love. Run along. Chop, chop. Charlie, have you ever paid Dirty Dickerson any money? Oh, sweetening? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I'd never entertain it. Never? Never. Of course, I, I do know someone's as sweetened him. Aha. Uh -huh. Like uh, Harry Harris. <laughs> you know a lot, do you? <laughs> well, I try to keep oh. abreast. So, you were known to the inspector as a dedicated non-payer. Yeah, well, you could say that. Uh, Mr. Featherson not here today, then? No, we've had a bit of luck with Mr. Featherson. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's got the flu. Oh. Now, it says here somewhere... There we are. Dickerson was about to offer you bail. Is that right? Yeah, but that seemed very funny to me. Like. Yeah, very funny with your record. Yeah, I, of course, he wanted something for it. Ah, the old... No, 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 no. He was asking me to put my hands up. What, make a confession? You weren't going to do it. No, I wouldn't do that, Mr. Rampole. It's not the way I work. All the same, uh, yeah. I did string him along a bit. I let him think we might do it here. <laughs> yeah. I think I like. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we even shook hands on it, like. What? What? Well, we, we shook hands on the deal. Well, he put his hand out and he took the mine off. You ever had your hand taken by an inspector before? No, only me collar. <laughs> Look, show me how he shook hands with him, will you? Now, you be the inspector. I'll be you. Oh, oh. well, uh, it, it was all over in a second. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I never made no statement. It's not in my character. How did he look when he shook hands with you? Did he look triumphant? Mm -hmm. I mean, did he look pleased with himself? Well, I don't know. I, I couldn't hardly see him. What? What? Well, it was in my show, you see, in the dark with Nick, I don't know, two o'clock of the morning. I was half asleep. And him, well, he was in the dark, like. He did seem a little bit nervous. Nervous? Well, you know what you expect from a man of his build, good, firm grip. Well, that hand of his was a bit clammy, like, soft, you know. Well. How are you feeling about this case, though, Mr. Rumpel? Feel like stout Cortez. Oh? Cortez, when with eager eye he stared at the Pacific and his men looked at each other with a wild surmise. What's you got me there, Mr. Rumpo? Keats. Ah. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. It's been, a, it's been an autumn of Keats, really. Ah, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Well, enough of that. I'm completely recovered. Rumpo resurrected. You reckon we've got a chance, then, Mr. Rumpo? A tiny chance, Charlie, like a small electric light bulb in a dark cell. Well, this Keats been straightening Dickerson, then? Huh? No, but Harry Harris has. Now, look, I can't call you. Do you understand that? I can't let the jury have your excellent record as a safe blower read out to them. But I want your express instructions. You have them, Mr. Rumpel. What have you got in mind? Well, I think we ought to ask Dirty Dickerson a few distasteful questions, with your kind permission. I can think of a few. <laughs> a bet. Now, let's see. Something like, uh... And finally, Detective Inspector, you have there Exhibit 12. I have, my lord. But we've heard from the expert that Wheeler's fingerprints are on that small piece of jelly mat. Where did you find it? Beside the safe at the scene of the crime, my lord. At the Dartford Post Office. Uh, yes, my lord. Thank you, Detective Inspector. Have you any questions you want to ask the Detective Inspector, Mr. Rumpel? Just a few, my lord. Well, then, let's get on with it. You know a man called Harris, Harry Harris? I know a Harry Harris. Friend of Charlie Wheeler's? Yes. How would you describe him? Want me to describe him? Mr. Rumpole has asked you the question. Presumably he's prepared to take the risk of you answering it. Harris is a minor villain around the Dartford area, sir. You see, the danger of asking questions, Mr. Rumpole, 
Have you ever had any financial dealings with Harris? My lord. Will you not interrupt my cross-examination? Can I ask her questions about this Harris are in any way relevant to the case of Wheeler? Is Harris connected with this case, Mr. Rumpel? Not this case, my lord, but I hope to then show... Then your question is entirely irrelevant. My lord, when the character of this witness is brought into question... Oh, I'm... really? Are you attacking the character of this police officer? I am not offering him a gold medal. I see your learned leader is not in court. Uh, no, my lord, unfortunately struck down by the flu. Uh, then I can only assume you are making this attack on instructions. I take full responsibility, my lord. Would you like me to adjourn your cross-examination before you have crossed the Rubicon? Thank you, my lord. But I am quite happy to proceed. I assume you're not making this suggestion without being in a position to call this man Harris. Of course I can call him. Uh, my lord, may I say something? Call us Detective Inspector. What is it you wanted to say? I wanted to say that I have never had any financial dealings with the man Mr. Rumpo mentioned. I have never had any financial dealings. Very well. Mr. Rumpole has his answer. It may not be quite the one he expected, but he has his answer. Yes? It's no good. His sister hasn't seen him for two years. Oh. Do you want to keep trying? Yes, for God's sake, keep trying, Miss Goodfellow. Is that all, Mr. Rumpole? Uh, not quite, my lord. Detective Inspector, when Charlie Wheeler was in the Dartford Nick... Where? Did you... In the police cells at the Dartford Police Station, my lord. There is such a thing as the English language, Mr. Rumpole. It is just as well to use it. Did you have any occasion in the cells at Dartford Police Station to shake Charlie Wheeler by the hand? Is my English plain enough for you? Shake his hand, and I have done. Have you ever shaken a prisoner's hand before? Not that I can remember. Then why should you shake Charlie Wheeler's? Your client told me he was about to make a confession statement. I was congratulating him on showing a bit of sense. Is that the answer you wanted, Mrs. Rumpel? Yes, my lord, it is. I wish to establish that this officer took my client by the hand. As he was prepared to make a confession. Did you discuss bail with Charlie Wheeler on that occasion? Bail? No, sir, there was no discussion of bail whatsoever. Did you say that you would not oppose bail if he made a confession? I said nothing of the sort, my lord. Mr. Rumpel, are, any, are there any further allegations of impropriety to be made against this officer? Only one, my lord. Could I have Exhibit 12, please? That is the piece of gelignite. With your client's fingerprints on it. Who found this piece of gelignite? I did, at the scene of the crime. Did you show it to any other officer? When I got back to the station. Oh, when you got back to the station. So the jury must rely in this case on your evidence and your evidence alone that this piece of gelignite was ever at the scene of the crime. Well, if my evidence isn't good enough, my lord... Your evidence isn't good enough. Charlie Wheeler is entitled to an acquittal. Had you ever, in your long experience, known a safe blower to leave a piece of gelignite at the scene of the crime with his fingerprints on it? <laughs> Criminals never made mistakes. We would never have trials at the Old Bailey, Mr. Rumpel. You see, there is another possibility the jury may have to consider. Is that? Yes, we have no idea as to when Charlie's fingerprints got on this piece of gelignite. Haven't we? Or where... Is it possible, Detective Inspector, that Charlie Wheeler only touched this gelignite in the cells at the Dartford Police Station? I don't know what you mean. In that dark cell at two o'clock in the morning. Do you think you had it in your hand when you held out your hand to him and shook hands with him as you had never shaken hands with a prisoner in your life before? If Wheeler's saying that, if, then it's all lies. You know that, Mr. Rumpel. All lies. And unsupported, as far as I can see, by a scrap of evidence. Members of the jury, I think, would come as a relief to all of us. If we adjourn for luncheon, Detective Inspector, you're still under cross examination. Yes, ma'am. Two o'clock. Be outstanding. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Featherstone's heard from the doctor, sir. He's oh. to stay in bed for the rest of the week. Oh, how jolly for him. Excuse me. He was asking, is it all over? Oh, tell him uh, it's all going according to plan. There's nothing to send his temperature up. Yes, sir. I told Matthew not to be careful. I took the best, and it's all going like a Oh, is it, Mrs. Lee? Sir? I took your advice, you see, and it seems really? as... Yes. Oh, yes, I won't give It seems there's no real measure to the verbals, and the police never even gave him a caution. And the judge is with me. He keeps saying things like, please answer Miss Trent's questions. Good news from somewhere, Miss Trent. You were right, of course, when you said fight everything. Fight everything. What else have we got left to do? We, uh... I take the most serious view of the violent crime of which the jury has, quite rightly, convicted you. You've not made matters any better for yourself by your vicious attack made through your counsel and the honesty of the police. You know, I never wanted my barrister well, to... I never wanted my barrister to ask some questions. I told him to keep quiet. You have the most appalling record. The least sentence I can pass is one of... Twelve years imprisonment. Taken down. Thank you, Mr. Rumpole. Yes, well, no. I have something to add, Mr. Rumpole. What? Your attack on the integrity of Detective Inspector Dickerson was not only unsupported by the evidence, it was apparently made without instructions I take the most serious view of it. Fourteen years. I intend to report the matter in the proper quarter. If your lordship pleases. Yes, standing. Reported to the benches of your inn. A disciplinary hearing before the Senate. My dear Rumpel, I don't want to worry you. Oh, on the contrary, Is... you're having a most calming effect. I have thought about it, you know, retiring from the bar. Perhaps to open a small market garden behind Gloucester Road tube station. I've had to write to the Senate myself about the case. Yes, of course. To tell them that the attack on Dirty Dickerson was an escapade dreamt up by your learned junior. That's perfectly understandable. You'll confirm that, of course. Oh, don't worry, old sweetheart. You've got a perfect alibi. Don't you rather wish now that you've been laid up with flu during Regina versus Wheeler? You want the truth, Governor? <laughs> All right, I'll come clean. You got me banked the right. Rumpo. I loved that cross-examination. I enjoyed every minute of it. I swear to God I was onto something. If only I'd had a bit of straw to make a brick. I hope you're not going to say that in front of the Senate. Well, what would you suggest, I said, as my brief... In your enthusiasm, your understandable enthusiasm on behalf of your client's interests, you were carried away, Rumpo. In the heat of the moment, you made an attack on the honesty of a senior police officer, which you now deeply regret. If your lordship pleases. The worst aspect of the case, in my opinion... What do you opinion, think they'll give me probation? The worst aspect of the case, in my opinion, is that you proceeded entirely without instructions. Oh, but I did have instructions. From Wheeler. That's right. And he denied them. Well... What do you expect him to do? Well, then you'll have notes of them. Oh, I'm too old to take notes in or out of court. I well, carry things in my head. Our solicitor, Bernard, will have uh, taken notes of them. Bernard was off enjoying himself at the funeral. Well, then Joyce will remember. We'll get Joyce, Joyce wasn't there. Well, she was doing a fraud with Hoskins in the West Court. Are you telling me that you actually saw the client alone? Good God. Oh, I don't know. It all seems perfectly simple to me. No. No, I... I shall have to give it a great deal of thought. Give what a great deal of thought? What I am going to say on your behalf! To the Senate! Say? I don't want you to say anything. You don't let mitigate. Thank you. What the devil are you doing here? Your wife invited me to dinner. Yeah. She just telephoned me at Chambers and asked me. For the first time in eight years. Now, why do you think Hilda had this sudden urge to have you share our cutlets? You know perfectly well that Hilda's worried, Rumpel. Oh? And so am I. 
very worried by the stand you're taking. Stand, George? What stand is that? Well, this wretched fellow, this 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 wheeler. Ah. Yeah, how can he be worth your risking your career over, Rumpel? And Hilda says you admitted to her that the fellow was a professional safe blower. Exactly, George. Professional. That is the operative word. So he wouldn't leave his fingerprints all over the shop, would he? Now look, do you honestly believe, can you put your hand on your heart and say that you really believe that this fellow Wheeler was innocent? Oh, come on, George. Now, what sort of a question is that? No, but I mean in this particular case. How many of your clients can you swear were innocent? I think you don't believe he was innocent. If you want my view of the matter, and my view is strictly irrelevant... Yeah, all the same. I should like an answer to my question. Oh, well done. We'll make a cross-examiner of you yet. Well, all right, the answer's no. No, I don't believe he was innocent. In fact, I think that Charlie Wheeler probably did blow that safe at the Dartford Post Office. Yeah. So, no injustice was done? Probably not. Well, that is good news. You've seen sense at last. What's good news? Ah, Hilda, I honestly believe that Horace has seen sense at last. Oh, I knew you'd be able to talk to him, George. Rumpers always told me George is so sensible. <laughs> Rumpers always had an enormous amount of respect for you, George. Oh, thank you, Rumpel. Well, Guthrie Featherstone agrees with me that the whole thing can be dealt with by way of an apology. And now that you've admitted it was quite unnecessary to attack the officer... Unnecessary? Did you say unnecessary? Uh, black or white, George? Oh, oh, black, please, Hilda. You said yourself, Rumpel, that this fellow Wheeler was almost certainly guilty. Guilty or innocent is not the point. That is not our business, and you know it. That is for 12 puzzled old darlings pulled in off the street to decide. But we can make sure that they are not lied to or deceived or conned by some... Smiling copper doing conjuring tricks in a dark cell, can't we? Oh, dear. Have some more port. Talk to him, George. Please try to talk to him. I have been talking to him, Hilda. I did talk to him. Listen, Rumpel. Yeah. Forget Wheeler for a moment. You've got yourself to think about. Oh, I am thinking myself. You see, Hilda, with the insurance and what we get for this flat, we could buy quite a nice little cottage. And a small holding. Small holding? George! Have you gone mad, Rumpel? You wouldn't know what to do with a small holding. Dig it and dung it. That's what you do with it. Grow the things I've always been rather fond of. Artichokes, leeks, parsnips, marrows. And in the fullness of time, your actual asparagus. list of seeds and things. How old is Rumpel? Do you think he might be going a bit No. Tired? Well, you sound very positive. First thing I learned at the bar, first thing he ever taught me, was never underestimate the cunning of Rumpel. Yeah, well, I, I don't think he's been very cunning in this particular instance. Obstinate. Incredibly obstinate. And do you know what he's saying now? Even if they just suspend him for a little while, even if they censure him, he'll leave the bar and he won't apologise. Well, then surely one thing's perfectly clear, George. What's that? Rumpel has absolutely no one to blame but himself. Come on, Philly, it's time we were off. I've just got to pop back to Chambers and pick up a brief. Yeah, I'll catch you up. We're off for the Festival Hall tonight. You going to send us up some nice, fresh vegetables? What? Peas and carrots, new potatoes. Uh, oh, it sounds delicious. Yes, I have been having doubts. Oh, dear, have you? Looking back on my life all those years at the bar, I can find absolutely no evidence for the proposition that I have green fingers. Well, neither have I. Eh? My pot plants, they all go yellow. It's just every time I visit a jail, I look at the trustees planting out their rows of chrysanthemums in the sooty soil. That's it. I think that's the job I'll have when I'm in the nick. Oh, really? You're not going to the nick. You told me never to underestimate your coming. Like the time when I was prosecuting you and you got me to bore the magistrate with a load of law and you won the case. You finally tumbled to that, did you? Well, if you can do that in the dock street, can't you deal with this little case of yours at the Senate? I shan't apologise. Of course you won't. Why were you thinking of it? Was I? Creeping off to the country to grow vegetables. It's like pleading guilty. Well, stuff that for a lark. Miss Tratt, I remember when you first came to Chambers, you were rather a straight-laced young lady, only interested in law reports. Yes, well, I've learned a lot since then. Uh, from your pupil master, Erskine Bryan. No, from you. What is it you say we should have written up in letters a foot high in Chambers? Never plead guilty. Uh, bricks without bricks, Miss Tratt. Bricks without a bloody shadow of a brick. Unless... Well, go on, unless... Unless someone can lay their hands on a gentleman called Harry Harris. You'll find a defense. I know you will. I promise you I'll be thinking about it. 
all through Marley's age. Oh. What will they do to me? The Senate of the Inns of Court. That august body. Change me utterly. I might come out of there as someone quite new. As myself. But who am I? I remember startling Hilda with that question once. Of course, she didn't know either. I seem to have spent my whole life being other people. Safe blowers, fraudsmen, a few rather gentle murderers. I really had remarkably little time to be rumpled. Whoever that may be. Shall I have time now? Time hanging heavy on my hands. Forever. Mr. Rumpel? Guilty, my lord. Mr. Rumpel? Uh, Got word. You wanted to see me, Dickerson. You've been a naughty boy, talking out of turn. You want to buy me a Chinese, do you? <coughs> the uh, A1 combination with a sweet and sour lobster. Yeah, I'll be glad to. I thought you would. You've been a bit late with your instalments, Harry. Huh? Oh, sorry, Dickerson. I've been travelling, you see. We'll leave a forwarding address there. We'll get on much more nicely if I can bleed you regular. I think a bottle of Chablis would go down well with a sweet and sour. Um, a, a bottle of... Uh, 24. 24. Can't we forget about it now? Forget what, Harry? A couple of fingerprints on a gold case. You'd better care less, Harry. It's where you put your fingers. They're as bad as your friend, Charlie Wheeler. Yeah. I heard you fitted Charlie up nicely, too. Fitted him up? Who told you I fitted him up? The jury convicted him, didn't they? Unanimous verdict. Oh, he's such a nice, friendly lad, is Charlie. He'd shake hands with anyone, wouldn't he? All right, Harris. Very funny. Very funny, indeed. Uh, I guess that's OK. But let this be a lesson to you. Uh, Jill. You don't bleed regular. And I'll have your fingers around the lump of jelly. Like. Like I did with Charlie. Still waiting for anyone. Rumpel? Hmm. Well, Rumpel said he'd probably have to miss the chamber's meeting. The Senate hearing, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, perhaps you'll join us later. Yes, well, he said to start without him. <laughs> Mind you, Rumpel never minds missing a chamber. Well, shall we begin? What? Right, first item on the agenda. The question of accommodation in chambers. Oh, yes, Erskine Brown. Yes, well, now that Hoskins is having all these conferences, it's really becoming like padding from station upstairs. Well, I'm out in court every day. I don't mind mucking in. Uh, well, perhaps Erskine Brown would uh, like to fill us in on this one. Well, it seems likely we shall soon be having a vacancy in chambers. What do you mean, exactly? Well, Philly, Rumpel made it quite clear before the hearing that he intends to leave the bar and grow vegetables. Vegetables? I haven't heard anything about vegetables. Look, perhaps it would be better if we waited for Rumpel. Yes, I agree. I think this is... Well, I think it's important we should decide what our policy is. I mean, as you know, our own room is impossibly overcrowded. George Frobisher himself has to share a room with Hoskins, which isn't always convenient when it comes to conferences. I mean, do we take in another young man who could make himself useful about the place and, and do a bit of paperwork and so on? 
Or do we solve our own acute accommodation problem simply by taking over Rumpel's room? Ah, Rumpel. Oh, Rumpel, good heavens. You want to take over my room, Erskine Bryan? I'm sorry I'm late. No, not at all. Um, now, perhaps you can help us. We were just discussing the possible future. Were well, you all right? So was I. And do you know what? The possible future is rather interesting. You remember Detective Inspector Dirty Dickerson? Well, he's been suspended pending a full inquiry. And when Charlie Wheeler heard that in the nick, he suddenly recalled giving me those instructions. So we're applying to the appeal court with fresh evidence. <laughs> well, I am relieved, Rumpel. Uh, you and I had better get our heads together then, Rumpel. Ah, well, I was rather thinking of doing the appeal alone, uh, without a leader. So the vegetables will have to be indefinitely postponed. Oh, I'm sorry, Erskine Bryan. I can't be more uh, accommodating. <laughs> What's the next item? On the agenda. Erskine Brown. Hilda! I'm in bed. It's over, is it, Brando? I'm afraid so. And on top of everything else, you've given me the flu. Oh, I am sorry. Oh, but don't knock it, Hilda. The flu is a disease with endless possibilities. Over. Oh, come on, cheer up. Here, have a gin and tonic. It's absolutely marvellous for the flu. <laughs> All over. Yes, no more peace, no quiet, no more just being rum above all, no vegetables. My chance of retirement gone forever. They've let you off. As a matter of fact, I got commended for picking out one of the very few rotten apples in that otherwise sweet-smelling barrow load, the Metropolitan Police. <laughs> Good God, you weren't worried, were you? Worried? Well, of course I was worried. Having you at home all day, every day, would have been impossible. Here, I give you a toast. Here's to our future. The future? Which now shows every sign of being exactly like our past.